welcome to the River Center. Thank you for joining us on our virtual field trip. My name is Megan and today we're going to learn about one of our favorite animals here at the River Center, sea urchins. We're going to be conducting a sea urchin lab. So I'm standing in front of the touch tank here and all of the animals that you're going to see all have some things in common. So let's take a closer look. Isn't that cool? So what makes all of these animals similar? Well, all the different kinds of urchins and sea stars and sea cucumbers are part of the phylum Econodermata. The phylum is the second part of the scientific classification system. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Econodermata means spiny skin in the Greek language. All of the animals that are found in this phylum are invertebrates, which means that they lack a backbone. And all of them are found in salt water, so they're considered marine species. This phylum has six classes and also includes things like brittle stars, sea lilies, sea daisies, sand dollars, as well as the urchins, sea stars, and sea cucumbers. There's actually more than 7,000 species of econoderms that are living today. So these animals share some common characteristics. First, they all have a radial symmetry. Their body is round, cylindrical, and star-shaped. Their body is unsegmented, they have the ability to regenerate or regrow certain parts of their body. They have a water vascular system, which means that they don't have blood like humans do. They're benthic organisms and are found on the bottom of the body of water. So that's a little overview about the animals that are econoderms. I'm going to send it over to Jocelyn where she's going to show you some experiments using sea urchins. Hey everybody, I'm Jocelyn, and now we're ready to start our lab. As scientists, we always start with observations first. So, I'm gonna invite you to come over to my aquarium here, and we are going to observe some sea urchins. Hmm, what are some of the first things that you notice? What do you see? What color are our sea urchins? Well, they're not all the same color, are they? We have some kind of reddish ones, got a green one, a pink one, one that's kind of white with reddish spines. They're all different colors, but they're all kind of the same shape, aren't they? They're pretty round. Do you see any of them moving? I bet you can see some of their spines moving. The spines are those pokey little things that you see sticking out of their bodies. Spines are moving. Do you see anything else moving? Perhaps something that looks like a little thread? Do you see that? What are some of the things that we don't see? Well, I don't see any eyes, do you? Or a nose? I don't see any fins or a tail. 
or scales or a mouth. Hmm, they don't look very much like fish, do they? No, they don't, because they're not fish. These are sea urchins. I'm going to take one of the sea urchins, and I'm going to move him over here to our testing area. OK, let's try. Well, you've been kind of moving around a little bit. Let's try you. OK, so we're going to move him over here. OK, now. We can see all the same things that we saw over there. His spines are moving, and I see some little thread-like things that they're moving as well. Those are his tube feet. The tube feet are little tiny suction cups that actually help the sea urchin to move. And you'll find those tube feet uh, lined up in between those spines. Now that we're looking at him a little bit closer, you'll notice that all of the spines are in rows and all of the tube feet are in rows. We call this radial symmetry. All right, so now I'm going to change something in his environment. I am going to place my finger on top of him and we're going to see what happens. All right, so now we're looking in here. We can see my finger in here. I can feel some of the spines moving underneath my finger. I can see some of those little tube feet moving as well. What do you think he's trying to figure out here? What's happening? Well, the spines are moving toward my finger, and I can feel some of the tube feet now on my finger. They use their spines for protection and for movement. And the tube feet are used for movement, as well as touching and tasting. So right now, he's actually kind of tasting me too. He's also moving inside. I don't know if you can see that or not, but he's moving underneath me, too. Is he moving away from my finger? What is he doing, I wonder? So if his two feet are for touching and tasting, does he taste with his mouth? No. Nope. I wonder where his mouth is. Now I'm going to take my finger out, and we're going to change our urchin again. Now this time I'm going to take him, and I'm going to give him a little gentle twist because he's already stuck. And we're going to turn him over. Now, when we turn him over, we can better see that part underneath. And if you notice, he's kind of moving his spines toward his mouth now as a way to kind of protect his mouth. The mouth is the most vulnerable part of a sea urchin. It is the softest part of their body. And you notice sea urchins, they don't move so fast. So if you wanted to eat a sea urchin, it'd be pretty easy to catch them. But they're all full of spines, so not so easy to eat them unless you can find their one soft spot. Now their mouth is on the bottom of their body. I wonder what it is that they eat. I wonder what might eat them. Hmm. Well, if they eat things that 
are underneath their body because that's where their mouth is, they must eat things like algae and detritus and things like that. Things that they can crawl on and then eat. Things that might eat them are certain kinds of fish, right, that might have um, teeth that can crunch through all those spines and things. Now hopefully he's going to turn himself back over. All right, so as you can see, he's got himself all turned back over, and that's kind of their instinct because they need to protect that mouth, right? So they need to get all their spines back up and protect their mouth, and it is now on the bottom again. So all the sea urchins that we've been looking at today are variegated sea urchins. They are all the same species, even though they are different colors. Now, variegated sea urchins have other ways of protecting themselves besides just their spines. And the other way that they usually protect themselves is through camouflage. So we're going to take a look at that today and see how they do it. So sometimes when we're looking for sea urchins, we'll kind of look for some shell clusters. Also, they may cover themselves with leaves or other things as well. Now, we're going to do a little experiment and see if they like different things other than shells. Because we know that sea urchins can't see because they don't have any eyes, right? So we're going to give him a shell. We're also going to give him a glass bead right here. Now I'm also going to put another shell kind of down in here so he can touch it in case he wants it. <laughs> I'll put another glass bead down here as well and see. What we're looking for is to see whether or not our sea urchin is going to move these items to better camouflage himself.
some of our shelves have changed position. He's dropped one of the gems, but one of the gems is actually moving underneath him. And his two feet are kind of feeling out all the other shells, and he's picked up an additional shell with his two feet. You can see that here. He's picked up this one. Looks like he's got at least two shells and maybe one of the jewels. Here we go. Oh, he had three shells. He dropped one. He's definitely got two shells that he's clearly holding on to. And he had moved that green jewel underneath him, but he didn't actually attach his tube feet to it. Now, sea urchins have uh, an interesting adaptation. If they are injured, they can regrow their spines and part of their test. That's the skeleton or structure of the sea urchin. Now, their other cousins the, in the echinoderm family are sea stars, and they can regrow their arms and sea cucumbers can regrow their intestines. That's an interesting thing to regrow, but they can. The nine-armed sea star is a species of starfish with long, slim, tapering arms attached to a small, circular, central disc. It typically has nine arms that can grow to a maximum length of 16 inches in diameter. If a limb is severed, a new, small one appears in the central region and extends outward. Regeneration is the ability of an animal cell to make new body parts during adulthood, just like they did during beginning development. Their growth throughout their entire life is indeterminate, which means they keep growing, and all the cells keep the ability to grow into whatever part that is needed. In order for them to do this, they need to receive the right signals from the rest of the body. Starfish seem to send the right signals, and their cells are able to change properly, allowing them to regenerate whole new limbs. We don't know yet exactly what those signals are or why some cells are able to change. Scientists think that it's easier because their bodies are not as complex as ours. Sea cucumbers can undergo a process called evisceration. In simple terms, it means that they can shoot out their internal organs. Afterwards, they regenerate their lost organs through the same process that sea stars and urchins can do. Now, no one is quite sure why this happens. If scientists could figure out how they regrow their lost body parts, maybe it could help doctors promote our bodies to regrow lost limbs or heal other serious injuries. Now, not all urchins cover themselves to camouflage themselves for protection. We have other sea urchins that use other forms of protection. Let's take a look at him and see how he's different. Well, he's still round like the other ones, right? And he does have spines, but look how different his spines are. These spines are long and thick, and if you notice here at the tips, they're actually not sharp. They're dull. That's kind of how he named, gets his name, the pencil urchin, because when you write with a pencil for a long time, it gets dull, right? Well, when these sea urchins first grow their spines, they are actually sharp. But they use these strong, thick spines to wedge themselves really tightly into rocks and corals and things like that to prevent their predators from pulling them out and eating them. And that's how they wear down the tips on their spines so that they're dull. So this is a slate pencil urchin. Now if I turn him over, you'll see he does have a mouth just like the other ones. Okay. Now his spines here are a little bit shorter, a little bit nubbier. But he does also have tube feet, and they do 
grow in between his spine rows, just like our variegated sea urchin. He won't use shells to protect or camouflage himself. Uh, they will always try to find somewhere, a little crevice or something where they can kind of tuck in and um, hide from their predators. And he's moving a little bit. These guys actually tend to move a lot slower than our variegated sea urchins. Probably because they spend most of their day just sitting in a, in a crevice. So, now we've seen some interesting behaviors that sea urchins will do when their circumstances change. First, I put my finger on the top of one of the sea urchins and his two feet and his spines move toward my finger. Next, I turned him over so we could get a better look at his mouth, but he didn't like that so much. He wanted to protect his mouth, so he did flip himself back over. And now we gave him a few different items for him to use for camouflage, and he selected a couple of the ones that he liked. Now, I keep saying he likes and things like that, but you know what? Sea urchins don't actually have feelings. In fact, sea urchins don't even really have a brain. They have what we call a neural net. So, these sea urchins are using their senses that they have to determine the best thing that they can use for camouflage based on the senses that they have, which is touch and taste. Now that we've learned all about sea urchins, I'm gonna ask you a question. Why are sea urchins important? How are they helpful to the ecosystem? Well, my name is Sarah and I'm actually gonna tell you guys why they're important. So sea urchins are an important part of our food webs. Lots of other marine animals like to eat urchins. Some predators, including crabs, certain kinds of sea stars, snails, sea otters, some birds, fish, and even people like to eat sea urchins. They're also very important because of what they eat. Sea urchins eat plant and animal matter, including kelp, sea grasses, decaying matter, algae, dead fish, sponges, mussels, and barnacles. A healthy food web is when all the food chains are balanced. Sea urchin habitats include seagrass, sea flats, mud flats, mangroves, rocky inlets, and coral reefs throughout the world. Healthy habitats equal healthy ecosystems. Our world is all connected. Healthy habitats include having healthy water. And clean water for sea urchins also means clean water for people in our community. So how can you help? Try participating in a local cleanup of our rivers, our beaches, and our shorelines. Limit the amount of fertilizers and pesticides that are placed on lawns and gardens. Those chemicals from the fertilizers and pesticides can potentially cause harmful runoff and excess nutrients that enter into our waterways, which could be unhealthy for plants, animals, and us. Excess nutrients also cause algal blooms that can affect water quality. It can also block sunlight from reaching seagrass beds, and it lowers the amount of oxygen within the water. When fishing, always make sure to pick up your fishing line and your bait bags. If you're fishing in a public park, use monofilament recycle bins if they're available. If you have a boat or a jet ski, be aware of seagrass beds and other protected and restricted areas. Those rules are there to help protect the habitat. Finally, when you're out playing in the lagoon, do the sea urchin shuffle with your feet to avoid stepping on and harming urchins as well as yourself. Thank you guys for joining us today here at the River Center and we look forward to seeing you guys at our next virtual field trip, which is Reptiles of the Loxahatchee, on Wednesday, October 21st at 10 a.m.